Hi everyone. We are excited to talk to you today. We have a special guest. I'm gonna get them on with us. Um, Melissa. Um, she is a fantastic resource and has been helpful to tons of families and we are lucky to have her today. Hi, Melissa. Hi, how are you? I am so good. So nice to see you. Um, nice to see we, you too. Yeah, so I know we've never actually had the chance to interact like this face to face. So it's really great to have the opportunity, but we've had um, contact and we've um, definitely uh, bonded over the importance of this area. And so that's where the genesis of this live comes from. Melissa had reached out and we were like, yes, we love making sure our families are protected. And we are super excited to tell um, everyone here who's listening, either part of the Mosey community or just curious and wanting to learn a little bit more about how they can safeguard their family as they build their family. And so Melissa, I, I could talk about you all day long, but I want you to just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, your area of expertise in this space, and um, you know we can start going from there. But hi, everyone. We see a lot of people coming along. Um, Feel free to comment what state you are in. And um, Melissa is licensed in how many states again? Thir I want to say five: Texas, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. Right. So, um, so if you guys want, it'd be great. I think it'd be helpful for Melissa if you want to comment where you're coming from. So Georgia, hi. Um, obviously, laws are going to vary state by state, um, and they're continuously changing, but I think this will be great to get us oriented. And Melissa, can you see the comments? I want to make sure you can see them too. Yes, yes. But if someone's asking a question because I'm blind, you might have to repeat the question for me. I just can see the states, but um, also it's scrolling very quickly. So yeah, um, but no, it's hard. I'll, it's hard. Yeah. But, um, I'll tell you a little yeah. bit about myself. I'm a little older, so this is actually my second Instagram live and I'm not that as computer savvy as many people. So you might have to give me a little bit of instructions on there, but I've been doing this area of the law for 26 years. So I'm good with that. I um, have three children that were born through gestational surrogacy. Um, my oldest is, you know, 25 and in med school. And so it's been a long time since I've been doing this. I do um, surrogacies, adoptions, egg donations, embryo donations, um, a lot of so a lot of home inseminations involve a lot of legal work so i do the contracts for the donors if it's a known donor if it's from a bank obviously you don't do a contract but i talk a lot about how to solidify the rights after birth or before birth and what can be done for the couples using um a home insemination and and really how to protect yourself so i think that's a lot of what we're going to talk about but basically it runs a gamut of anything to do with third party reproduction and the law. I've done that. I've helped, you know, find egg donors, surrogates, sperm donors, things like that as well. Um, I founded an agency for surrogacy a long time ago. So I, I do a lot of things um, involving reproductive law. But today, I believe we're just going to focus on, you know, home inseminations and what you can do to protect yourself. Yeah. So I'm not sure if anybody who's joined um, has specific questions. Um, so Melissa cannot necessarily give you direct legal advice about your situation, but she can help inform you about her perspective. Um, so we would, oh, wow, did, you did amazing work. It says, thank you for your services. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I thought so I that, might give an introduction if you want just about yeah. how to protect yourself a little bit. And so the, the first thing, if you're doing a home insemination, you want to know is is a home insemination can you do an insemination at home and legally cut off the sperm donors rights to the child right so for instance in new jersey you can't do you can't that isn't the way that you cut off the sperm donors rights there are ways that we can do it but for instance i know even though i'm not licensed i know in california if you have a contract you can do the insemination at home and cut off the sperm donors rights if you follow the rest of the state law okay so you want to make sure 
that if you're in a state, if you're doing a home insemination, and if you're in a state that you cannot do a home insemination to cut off the rights, there are other things you can do. So I like to give the, so if you are going to do a home insemination, and let's say you're in New Jersey, the thing you want to do immediately after birth is you want to have your partner, whether that is a male or a female partner, do a second or co-parent adoption. Those are the same thing. They have different names in different states. So even if you're married, you're going to want to do that, right? Because the goal of that adoption is that both people who are going to parent that child are going to be the legal parents. That might already be the case, but you also want to cut off that donor's rights to the child, right? So in New Jersey, if you do that insemination at home, single, married, unmarried with a partner, you can't cut off that donor's rights without going to court after birth to do a, an adoption, whether that's a single parent, a sec, second parent. And it's not a very hard process in New Jersey. It's called a confirmatory adoption. So there's no in-court appearance. It's all through paperwork. Any home study or criminal background check is waived. But my biggest fear is that people doing a, a, a home insemination don't know if any post-birth confirmatory process or post-birth process is needed. And if they leave that open, there is a slew of case law in various states where the donor has either gotten some rights to the baby or has been held liable for support because it was done at home without the proper legal advice. Yeah, so um, so for everybody joining, um, Melissa is a family reproductive rights lawyer. So she is licensed in um, a couple of states across the country, but has knowledge about the process. So if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll do our best to address them. Um, one of the things that Melissa was just talking about is making sure post birth that you have the rights of your family protected. I would love for you to share a little bit about pre birth. If you're working with um, a, a sperm bank versus a known donor, what are the things that you should think about for family building and how you want to approach that with um, and how it's different? You know, obviously with a sperm bank, they've gone through their own process there, but with a home insemination, what are the things people should really be thinking about at the conception process? Sure. So there's going to be a difference between a known donor, right, and a, what I call a currently identified, unidentified donor, right? Because I know that the term in the field is anonymous, but realistically, with 23andMe and the proliferation of home DNA testing kits and all these websites, there is never going to be assurance and it's actually going to be more likely that people are going to be able to find genetic ties to themselves in the future right in any of these banks if not the actual donor so if you have a currently identified donor i always recommend a contract because the contract isn't only about the legal rights right it's also about putting down on paper your expectations and sometimes a donor or a parent will back out once the contract is in writing because they see something in there that they might not, even though legally it might be okay, that they're just might not be comfortable with. So what if the donor says, hey, I'm fine, you cut off my rights, but I'd like to see the child once a year, or I'd like the child to meet my children. And you say, you know what, I don't really want to agree to that. I don't want to go into this arrangement with you having these expectations. So even there are are two purposes for the agreement. One is legal protection, and you have to see how much legal protection that agree gives you in the state. But to me, it also gives you like a meeting of the minds. And a lot of times when you're hammering out that agreement, you find out maybe you don't have a meeting of the minds, and maybe mm -hmm. this isn't the best idea to use this particular donor. Now, if you're going from a sperm bank, you can get pre-birth orders in many states cutting off your donor's rights. Um, but that is less likely to be necessary with a donor from a bank, right? Because the donor from the bank is unlikely to find your child before your child is of some age to send in their DNA. And at that point, the likelihood of any sort of rights being granted. So it is very, very low, but you could do it. So you could have what you call pre-birth orders and post-birth orders, right? Mm -hmm. So pre-birth, you can go to court and say, I want a declaratory judgment. And this is in most states. Each state are going to be different. 
declaring that we are the parents of this baby and that any rights to this donor are cut off. And, and in some states, you can do that. A lot of times why people like to do what's called a post-birth confirmatory adoption is because it, let's say they're a same-sex couple. This is more important for same-sex couples, right? So a marriage certificate, it, it, this is very confusing to people in the US. So if you have questions, please pop up. A marriage certificate solidifies your marriage. And right now it's respected in all the 50 states. And I say right now because I'm a little concerned about the Supreme Court. Um, and I've done a lot of um, litigation and other cases with the same sex community. And I just have fears that maybe those could be overturned at some point. But right now your marriage is respected, but your marriage doesn't have anything to do with children born inside the marriage, right? So if, if you want to make sure that your child is considered a child of the marriage, a post-birth confirmatory adoption does two things. It Adoptions are respected in all the 50 states and it has nothing to do with your sexual orientation. So that would mean that you are both parents of that child. It could also cut off any rights to a donor. And more importantly, it's usually good abroad as opposed to declaratory judgments that are not based on adoption. Sometimes if you move abroad, those are not respected and we have to go in and get different orders when people move abroad. So it really depends. The, the other benefit is that a lot of companies will reimburse adoption expenses, right? So for instance, a post-birth adoption in New Jersey, that's a confirmatory order with filing fees and everything you're talking about, maybe a couple thousand dollars at most. A lot of times a company has up to $5,000 adoption benefit. And if they do an adoption rather than a birth order, maybe their company will pay for it. If they're not married and do the adoption, there can be some tax federal tax benefits that are probably beyond the scope of this conversation, but it's definitely something to look into. So there could be monetary reasons why you do the adoption versus the pre-birth order as well as legal reasons. Yeah, so we did have a question. Let um, see if I can pull it back up. Um, somebody was asking Chef Skip the Barber, what about in California where same-sex parents can both be listed on a birth certificate? Should we still adopt after? So that would be something that you could ask um, a California lawyer, but I can tell you this because I've done it before for friends of mine who live in California. There is a pro se packet that you could get from California and you can do a post-birth confirmatory order in California. Again, I'm not, li I'm not a licensed in there, but you can do a, a post-birth adoption without a home study, without it, if you're married, and it's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, so uh, people do do it. It's not necessary, but people do do it because they're afraid of the Supreme Court opinion. They're afraid of traveling to foreign countries. So whether it's a hundred percent necessary is a debate among lawyers across the country in every state. But I can tell you in California, they do have a statutory streamlined process that either an attorney can help you with and the courts do send out packets to do it yourself. Um, it probably, unless the, the fee is not is, is hard for you, it's probably worth it to have some lawyer help you because I, I remember doing it for my friend and be, even being a lawyer, it did. there was quite a bit of paperwork, about 30 different pages of things I had to send, but they were pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, so for those of you joining, um, Melissa is a licensed lawyer who works in family reproductive law. She um, is licensed in a number of states and she's able to give some advice, but obviously you will need to seek out your own counsel in your own respective states. And we have another question. What about in Dallas, Texas? If we have a friend that is willing to do a notarized letter stating all, I'm assuming that you're asking about if, is a notarized letter essentially enough um, to serve as a legal record for release of parenthood from a known donor? Um, you really have to do, so I'm licensed in Texas. Texas is one of the states that really scares me because um, Texas is what we would call a red state. So um, it goes back and forth. Now, since you're a married couple, you're both going to be on that birth certificate. But in Texas, I always do a sperm donor agreement and 
um, a post-birth confirmatory adoption. Um, a notarized letter is not really an agreement, right? Um, you would want to make sure that you have representation on both sides when you do an agreement. Um, and if you're doing it at home, you're always going to be, the thing about doing it at home too, is that you're always going to be subject to a he said, she said, right? Um, and what I mean by that is, unless you're filming it, right? You're, you could say that you did a home insemination and so could your partner. And he could say he had sex with you. And that may be hard to prove. Mm -hmm. So home inseminations for, for that reason. And remember, I'm a lawyer, so I'm thinking worst case scenario, right? Um, so I want to make sure you have the best protection that you have. So Texas is one of those states where I go a little bit extra maybe than is necessary because I'm more afraid of the political climate there. Interesting. Um, so we have a few more minutes. Um, so I would love to know if there's any other questions, please do. I know someone had, did have a question about conceiving um, an egg freezing and so that we can answer that separately, but I did want to acknowledge we saw your question. We're just focusing right now on questions for Melissa. Um, and Melissa, so we talked about um, <clears throat> pre, I guess, essentially conception, and then we talked about post birth. So can you just do like a quick recap of the documents that typically people get? Um, I think those are the most, because you talked about it post birth. Um, I, I don't know the language again, so I want to just reiterate yes, it. To get, like the phrases in people's heads so they can go and do their research in their respective states. Sure, and I just wanted to point out though, that although I talked a lot about same sex couples, if you have, um, a married couple in New Jersey who's heterosexual using a known sperm donor, the same rule is going to apply. They're going to need mm -hmm. to do a post-birth confirmatory adoption because the, the donor's rights aren't cut off. It's just more common right now for, for the same-sex community, but there are plenty of heterosexuals who do this, and this advice doesn't apply it equally applies. So before birth, whenever you're using a known sperm donor, right? Because if it's an unidentified, you can't do a contract with them. You wanna have a contract for two reasons, right? Legal reasons and also emotional reasons, just to have everything laid out. Um, then you, you have your choice. You can do a pre-birth confirmatory order cutting off the donor's rights or a post-birth adoption. You can't adopt something that's not alive. So people will always call and say, um, can I do the adoption before the baby's born? And I know we have different ideas about what's alive, but what I mean is, while that baby is in someone's womb, it's not a separate person that's breathing apart from the womb. So until that umbilical cord is, is detached in every single state, you cannot adopt mm -hmm. uh, it as a person. Maybe that someday will be different, but you can't do it till post-birth. So we've got pre-birth court order or post-birth. Post-birth, most of the time, is an adoption. Mm -hmm. People don't like that word. They, they, they feel it's expensive and time-consuming, and based on the state, it may not be. So like that one person asked, a California confirmatory adoption is no court appearance, no home study, none of those things. Same thing in, in New Jersey. It's, it's pretty easy, and there can be financial benefits to it as well. If you go to your company or tax benefits, depending on whether you're married or not. So it's important to know all of those things. When we talk about preconception too, I just talked about legal. When we're doing home inseminations, I also like to make sure, okay, you're doing a home insemination with a known donor. Did you make sure that you and the person sperm you're using are disease free, right? Because we don't want a baby with any diseases, obviously, right? Did you do genetic testing? Um, that's probably a good idea. Did you see a doctor just to make sure that you're not putting sperm in into a place that maybe it, the environment could use, you know, some extra help? So it's always a good idea to talk to somebody knowledgeable because I would point you out, hey, you can do karyotyping for $300 at this place and find out if you have any recessive genes. Yeah. All of that is super important to, rem to remind everybody um, as well, right? When you're approaching a home insemination, the thing that we like to talk about is how you really are doing this with as an act of love, right? Because it takes an act of love to think about this and go through all the steps. And so considering your health, their health uh, for the known donor, 
um, is a, an initial step as well. So we did have some questions I want to get to, um, and then we'll wrap up. So non-birthing parent with same-sex partner in North Carolina saw post-birth adoption can be up to 8K. So this is from Emily Collins. Does that sound about right to you, or should we shop around? Thank you. I so, would definitely shop around. Um, I don't know North Carolina, but I certainly, if you email us at um, info at reproductive lawyer, I definitely can give you a list of names. I, I can tell you in the New York, New Jersey area, there are a couple thousand dollars. Um, New York tends to be a little more. You might be at the $3,500 range because there's a lot of things involved, but I've never heard of $8,000. Um, and so someone also asked about if no one is listed on as the father on the birth certificate, does that um, eliminate their rights? No. So that people misunderstand. A birth certificate is what we call a presumption of parentage, right? So let's just say, I always give this, let's just say you have sex with the milkman, right? And you have a baby with the milkman and your husband is going to be the presumed parent. He's on the birth certificate. Then the milkman sees the baby and says, hey, that's my baby. And within, I'm giving you New Jersey law. And two months after he files a notice that he's the father um, on what's called a certain registry, then they'll DNA test him and he's the father, so he's gonna go on the birth certificate. Birth certificates are presumptions of parentage. They can be challenged. Depending on the state law, there's a certain amount of time, but if you, you, don't, if you have a known donor in New Jersey and you do it at home and you don't do anything after, if the donor never comes after the kid and you never sue for parentage, nothing's gonna happen, right? But his rights are still there. Like they didn't yeah. go away just because you didn't name him on the birth certificate. Yeah. So um, I don't know if I'm frozen on everyone's screen, but it looks like I might be frozen. You're not? But, uh, frozen on I, oh, good, good, good. Um, I think I'm free. It's still late. That's good. Bit. So a question. Um, my spouse and I did reciprocal IVF. I carried her embryo. This is from Amanda, 89. Does she have to legally adopt our son? We are in Texas. So she's married, right? I'm going to assume that they are. Yes, because she said my spouse. Okay. So legally, so that's a post-birth adoption is a debate, right? Legally, they're both the parents. The child was born in the marriage. They did reciprocal IVF. I assume the sperm was from a bank and is a not a known person. They're both going to be considered the legal parents. They both contributed one womb, one egg. Whether or not they do the post-birth confirmatory adoption is going to be a choice of an extra layer of protection. Lambda Legal will tell you same-sex couples post-birth always do a post-birth confirmatory adoption. We believe in it. We're, we're nervous about your rights. We want you to have it. Is it 100% necessary? No, it's a belt and suspenders. Um, a lot of people do like to do it, though. Yeah. So, um these are all really great questions. Uh, somebody asked about references, so why don't we finish with that? Um, two things for you, Melissa. Can you share how people can find you, your website? And then, you know, if your website has any resources there or if there's a great place where people can, like, where do you look? You know, where do you send people just to educate themselves? What sites do you really respect? Sure. So um, the first thing that I would tell you is to get in touch with me. First of all, my name's not very common. You could always Google me and you'll get our website. But it's reproductivelawyer.com and you just can email us at info at reproductivelawyer.com. So as far as, you know, websites, Lambda Legal is a great website. I, I go there. They have a state map. They have practitioners that you can go to. Family Equality is another one. Um, here we have different like for instance we have out in montclair which is a a bergen county reference and we have a bunch of um we have new jersey pride and the empire state equality and so each state usually has some different divisions and different um types depending on what you're looking for so for instance i have quite a few trans clients that are doing um some parenting plans that are a little bit different than maybe my same sex couple. So I send them really to people in the area who help um, with treating trans people because they can be more sensitive to the vocabulary and their needs. So really, there are a lot of good resources um, that they can look into.
Yeah, you definitely want to find somebody who's supportive of you in the process as well. I know somebody who had mentioned earlier $8,000 for the post birth confirmatory adoption paperwork and that did sound a little high to me. So gut check yourself too. It's okay to shop around. Make sure you're working with a partner and a lawyer who is respectful of your needs and your family and um, who you are as a person. So with that, I'll, um, I'll close us out. You know, obviously we want to be as supportive as possible. We want to make sure everybody understands um, what they can do to protect themselves. And ju just to reiterate a couple of things that we discussed if you just joined recently, um, we want to make sure that you're thinking about um, post-birth, your rights, the rights of your sperm donor, if this is something where you want them to be involved or not involved. Um, that's something you should definitely have pre-birth, preconception, actually, talking through just to kind of recap some of what Melissa shared with us. Preconception, it's really a good time to get on the same page, work through some of that paperwork, see it in writing so you can get comfortable with um, where it sits. And then Melissa mentioned you can reach out to her at reproductivelawyer.com. Info at reproductivelawyer.com is her web address, her email address. And uh, as far as questions about the process of a home insemination, you can um, direct message us. We're happy to answer those. But definitely wanted to shine a light on Melissa's work today and all that she's doing to help make families um, protected under the law as they are um, built with love. They need to be respected as well under the law. And unfortunately, that is the world we live in today, and we need to make sure that we're all um, thinking through that process. So thank you so much, Melissa. Is there anything else um, that you'd like to add before we close out? No, no this is great. I, I always think that it's important to be as educated as you can about what you want and how you're doing it so that, you know, you have the right tools. That's why I think it's such a great company, because you have definitely given thought to making it easier for people to get pregnant at home. I just want to make sure that they think about, you know, the preconception things that are just as important to think about it wherever you're, you're going to have a baby, right? Yeah. Making sure that absolutely protected. Absolutely. So thank you everyone who joined. Um, I think we got to almost everybody's questions. If we didn't, feel free to message us or Melissa directly and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.